Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. In 1954, the Supreme Court mandated the end of segregated education in America. The story of the first black students to integrate Little Rock High School is well known. But a full year earlier, the town of Clinton, Tennessee was the first to attempt court-mandated desegregation. It's a story that was lost to history. Historian Rachel Louise Martin tells us Clinton's story this week, and we also discuss her interests in the politics of memory and the power of storytelling in addressing society's injustices. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. Rachel Louise Martin, the story that you tell in your new book, A Most Tolerant Little Town, centers around Clinton, Tennessee in the 1950s. Where is Clinton and describe what it was like in the 1950s? Clinton is right on the edge of the mountains that make up Appalachia. So it is about an hour north of Knoxville and it is right on the gateway to coal mining country up in Tennessee. And if you and I were there in the 1950s, what kind of a community would we find? It was, an, it was actually an interesting place back in the 50s. It was very, it was very mixed up about itself. So on the one hand, it was a small rural Southern Appalachian town full of coal miners and farmers and local business people. But it was also seven miles from Oak Ridge, which was a secret city built as part of the Manhattan Project that built the first atom bombs. And it was also about seven miles from Norris Dam, which was the first Tennessee Valley Authority project. So while it was up in the mountains and isolated and rural and small, it was also very connected. In 1956, it was a sort of place that both presidential candidates felt like they had to go and campaign, even though there were only a couple thousand people there. So the story about Clinton you tell is of the first school under federally mandated desegregation. Uh, how did it come to your attention? Because as you point out, we all know about Little Rock, but not so much about Clinton, Tennessee. Uh, it started out as a work assignment. After I finished my MA, I took a year off before finishing the rest of my graduate degree. And I worked as an oral historian for the Center for Historic Preservation at Middle Tennessee State. And there I was sent into lots of different tiny Southern towns. I was usually supposed to do somewhere between five and a dozen interviews that would help support a National Register nomination or a new museum, which is what was happening in Clinton or something like that. And so I would come in, I'd do a bunch of interviews for a couple of days, I would take them back, transcribe them and move on to the next place. Clinton stuck with me. I had never heard the story. I found what I was learning about it very compelling. I found the people very compelling. And so I ended up working on it for the next 18 years. What kind of reception did you have at the time when you were asking people to tell memories from so many decades back? The very earliest one, because I was there working with the town, I didn't actually have to set up many of my own interviews. That was being done for me. So I was going to people who were very ready to talk. Many of them hadn't ever told their stories before, definitely outside their family, sometimes even to their own family. So there were moments when they would get uncomfortable with the storytelling process, but they were all people who were very eager to share. As I got deeper into the research and started trying to push out beyond the folks who were already involved with the museum or with the commemorations that had started happening, there was a lot more resistance. How did Clinton come to be the first federally mandated desegregated school? It was because of a woman named Winona McSwain. She was a black woman from the area. Um, when she was coming up through school, they actually did not have any sort of secondary education available to black teenagers at all. So when they would graduate from junior high, they would either have to drop out of school or if their parents had enough money, they could get shipped off to a boarding school somewhere. But obviously we're talking about 
rural Appalachia, there weren't many parents who had that sort of income available to them. And so her education ended when she was about 13 and she had always wanted more. She had loved learning and she really believed that learning was essential. So when her own kids were born, she had a number of them, um, she began working toward improving education in Anderson County, which is where Clinton is based. And she had a lot of different ways that she went about this. Um, at one point, she actually convinced the county to pay for her kids to get sent away to school, to boarding schools. Her sons usually went to Nashville and lived with her sister in Nashville and went to a school in Nashville. Her daughters were sent off to a Methodist boarding school up in the mountains. Um, but by 1950, the county had decided they weren't gonna pay for that anymore. And so Winona McSwain was told her kids were going to have to go to a failing black school a county away. And she said, absolutely not. That is an inherently unequal education. Clinton High School is one of the top rated high schools in the state. You're not gonna send my kids off to a terrible high school when they have an amazing high school just down the way. So she, along with, and her children who were of high school age, along with some other kids of high school age in the town and their parents, marched into the principal's office one day in 1956, or 1950, excuse me, and attempted to register for classes. The principal said, absolutely not. They went to the superintendent of schools. He said, absolutely not. And so they sued the county. And that became the case that in 1956 forced desegregation. What should we know about the federal judge who issued the ruling in their case? Oh. Robert Taylor was a fascinating guy. Um, he had a deep, deep roots in Tennessee politics. Um, his dad and his uncle had both been governor and um, had actually competed against each other for various political posts over the years. And there are all sorts of stories about that. Um, and he was someone who really tried to use his position to better life for people in his district as a federal judge. At the same time, he was absolutely a segregationist. And so after the ruling is placed in Brown versus Board of Education, and he's told that desegregation is now the law of the land, that separate is inherently unequal, he's, he's left with quite a conundrum on his hands. And he becomes one of the first of the local citizens to say, I may not agree with desegregation, but I will follow the law. Uh, I call them the law and order segregationists. And so he ends up mandating school desegregation, even though he doesn't believe in it, because it is federal law. Um, and he ends up having to enforce it. He's, his, he's tested multiple times. There are many times he could have walked away and really decided not to pursue the implementation of his court order. And instead, he sticks, to, he sticks with it. Um, he makes it all the way through. How much time was there between him issuing the order and the start of the, the desegregated school year? He issues the order in January of 56, and the school year starts at the end of August. So um, not much time. How did, the, uh, how, time. Did, how did Clinton's population and the school board and school react to the judge's order with so little time to prepare? No, oh, well, there are, there are very different reactions. I think a lot of people in town, both black and white, really never believed it would happen. And some of the students who end up desegregating the school actually went back to their high school and bought tickets to their senior prom because they assumed they would still be going to their black high school, that there's no way they would end up in a white high school the next semester. Um, there are, uh, the school board just refused to deal with it at all. They did not meet with the principal to discuss the implementation of the court order until almost the end of the first semester of school. So they just, they did many things to try to stop it from happening um, through basic inertia, but they, they did not, except that it was happening for a long time. Um, 
But then you have someone like the principal, Principal DJ Britton Jr. He was another person who none of the white people in town ever at this point said they believed in desegregation. He openly said, I am a segregationist. Nevertheless, this is the law of the land. And as a principal, I am responsible for giving all of my students the best education possible. And so beginning that spring semester before desegregation, he started planning for it. He met with teachers. He found a teacher who would act as the black students unofficial guidance counselor. And so she began meeting with them about what classes to take. Um, they were given exactly the same entrance exams that any other teenager coming in, matriculating into Clinton High School would have received. And based on those scores, several of them were put into the college preparatory track. Um, so he, he really tried to treat them fairly at the same time saying, I do not want you here. Um, and he also said, I am legally mandated to desegregate academically, socially, nothing is going to change. Black students are not allowed in any of the social events. They cannot participate in plays. They cannot join any sports teams. So he really drew a lot of lines around how far desegregation would actually go. I read in your book that, that segregated schools was actually part of Tennessee's constitution at that time. Yes, there is a set of white adults in Clinton who actually sue, arguing the school should be stripped of all state funding because they have desegregated. And legally, it wasn't, a, I mean, obviously, morally, it was a terrible argument, but legally, it wasn't a terrible argument. Um, that is what the state law said. But in this case, federal law superseded it. Yes. Yes. So the ongoing battle over states' rights. So, but as you describe it, it sounds like Principal D.J. Britton was, was acting without any kind of guidance on how to proceed and no support from his school board. Uh, yes. So where do you think he understood how to make this work? Uh, even if he was opposed to it, he wanted to make it work. How do you think he uh, operated in those months planning the, the opening day? You know, it, that is a question that has really fascinated me. And I wish I could read his notes from that era. He ordered his family to burn all of his papers from that, that season of his life after his death. Um, so I'm gonna have to go off a supposition. First, he was a very methodical man and someone who understood people quite well and understood teenagers remarkably well. Um, he had he had great instincts as to how to interact with and handle people in a moment of difficulty and knew how to diffuse situations very effectively. And so I think a lot of it for him was just years of teaching and experience um, he came from a long line of educators as well. His dad was principal at another nearby high school. One of his uncles was a school superintendent. His mom was a teacher. His wife was a teacher. So I imagine he also turned to them and said, what would you do here? How would you handle this? And then he was, he was a consensus builder. He spent a lot of time meeting with parents and meeting both black and white. He also met with students and he, he spent a lot of time in faculty meetings, getting everybody at least to the point of saying, we will obey the law. Um, he recruited the football team, even though many of them didn't wanna do it. Um, so he, he really worked within his sphere of influence at trying to build the best solution he could. Um, it, it ended up getting out of his control, but I really think that he did everything within within his ability. Opening day, uh, opening day of school in Clinton was August, Mon it's a Monday, August 27th, 1956. Can you, I wanted to get their names on the record. Can you list all of the students who were, uh, the black students who were enrolled on that first day? I absolutely can, but because we're doing this on television, I'm going to panic and worry that I'm about to miss somebody. So I'm going to pull my book. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and do a cheat sheet. So the 12 black students' names alphabetized because I'm using my cheat sheet. 
where Joanne Allen, Bobby Kane, Anna Teresa Caswell, Minnie Ann Dickey, Gail Ann Epps, Ronald Hayden, William Latham, Alva J. McSwain, Regina Turner, Maurice Souls, Robert Thacker, and Alfred Williams. Thank you for that. The black parents that enrolled their kids in Clinton High School were knowingly sending them off to the front lines of the racial justice movement, the civil rights movement in this country. How prepared do you think they were and their children were for what would lie ahead? You know, on the one hand, they had all at least spent considerable time in the segregated South. Many of them had lived in the South all of their lives. Many of them had lived in Clinton and Anderson County all of their lives. And so they really knew how deep this commitment to white supremacy went within their world. At the same time, nobody had done this before. And so they were, they were going without any real guidance. Um, the closest anybody had come was at nearby Oak Ridge, where they had been forced to desegregate their schools a year earlier because they were a military base. But because they were a military base, that was done under federal protection. It was done, I mean, all, everybody living on base was dependent upon the federal government for their housing. No one owned their own homes at this point. They were dependent on the federal government for food and for their incomes, for everything else. So they had seen Oak Ridge successfully desegregate. And that, I think, gave them some hope that they would have a similar experience. Um, and so I think at the beginning of the semester, many of them went into it saying, well, of course, there will be some name calling. There will be a little resistance. They knew that there had been some folks who had sued, for instance, suggesting that the state strip Clinton High of its funding. Um, they knew there had been a petition that had been circulated among adults around, white adults around Clinton, um, where hundreds of them had signed pledging their resistance to desegregation. But I think at the beginning of that first day, everybody hoped that that would be about as far as it went. That Clinton was, which is a quote from one of my one of my narrators, a most tolerant little town. There would be some folks who didn't like it, but everybody would end up law and order. So what was their first day like? For many of them, it was very hopeful in the beginning. There were somewhere around 50 to 75 protesters outside, um, but they stayed on their side of the street. The black children were able to walk into school pretty much unmolested. Um, the first day, one of the black girls was actually elected as the vice president of her homeroom. Her name is Joanne Allen Boyce. Um, I have to give her her own little plug. She has a book out for middle grade and it's fantastic if you have a kid who is looking to learn more about desegregation. Um, but she was elected vice president of her homeroom. Other kids, the teachers do the typical first day of school thing, like tell us your name and tell us what you like to do. All of those introductory questions you ask a new student. Um, at the end of the day, a couple of the boys even tell a reporter Things here are going so well, they might let us try out for basketball next semester. Um, Principal Britton is gonna see that this is successful. Unfortunately, by the end of the day, all of that had fallen apart. Um, after school lets out, a black woman who's walking by is pushed down, her glasses get broken, another woman has a bottle thrown at her. Um, some kids try to rough up a black teenager who has nothing to do with the desegregation. De um, and then that night, white segregationist protesters take over the courthouse square and host the first of a series of nightly rallies, getting everybody all riled up about desegregation and what's happening. So by the next morning, there are many more people outside the school, 
and it's it's a lot more contentious and heading towards violence very rapidly. You mentioned talking to a reporter. How had this already come to the attention of the national media by day one? Day one, they're doing basic stringer AP sorts of reports, picking up stuff from local media. Um, so it's primarily folks who live or, or who live nearby who are getting their own reporters in there. So the Knoxville paper is there, the Clinton paper is there, the Oak Ridger is there. Um, that changes fast, but on that, that on that first day, it's pretty low key. It eventually comes to the attention of the uh, very well known re CBS reporter Edward R. Murrow. And he, he uh, created a, a, an hour long program about Clinton. And we have uh, several clips that show the principles so our audience can see and hear some of the people involved in this. But do you wanna tell me a little bit about Edward R. Murrow's program? And, uh, and it comes later in the story, but the fact that he was interested enough to send a whole CBS news crew down uh, and what the addition of the national media on that town did to the people of the town. Yeah, Edward Murrow is one of the last of the journalists to come to town, actually. Um, by really Thursday of that week, there are reporters in town, there are multiple photographers from Life Magazine, just everywhere, and they created an incredibly rich trove of photographs of life in Clinton. Um, the New York Times has uh, one of their big reporters. Um, is John Popham is in town. Um, there are folks from Paris and London, all uh, literally around the world, covering the Clinton story. Um, when Murrow comes to town, he does bring his entire documentary team with him to record what has happened. And there are a lot of there are a lot of people in town, especially the law and order segregationist folks who say that the reporters are making everything worse, that they're turning it into a circus, that they are spreading the word and causing more outsiders to come in to protest this. Um, there, there are some that really blame a lot of the violence on the reporters even being there. And some of the officials who start trying to get control of the world also say the same thing about the reporters. Um, many of the Black residents in Clinton feel differently, and it's, uh, it's exactly what we see today. So much violence, especially racial violence, can be ignored or denied or blamed on the community being attacked until you have a camera rolling. And when you have actual documentation of what's happening to the people, all of a sudden the world begins to pay more attention. The pressure on local officials and state officials and federal officials increases rapidly. And honestly, I think that especially during those first few weeks, the presence, presence of the national and international press may have saved some lives just because there were cameras there. The story in Little Rock uh, a year later would be one of uh, troops helping to ensure the students' safety. In those first couple of days, did they have any support from law enforcement or from the federal government, which had mandated this order, or were they really on their own as they navigated through the protesters? They were completely on their own. Um, the Black students and the Black families they lived in a neighborhood overlooking downtown. It was originally called Freedman's Hill because that is where people had moved after emancipation. That got shortened by 1956 to simply the hill. Um, and the police provide them zero support, zero protection. Um, as a result, actually the black men, many of whom were veterans, began organizing themselves in order to provide protection for their families. And they deployed themselves at night around the hill to just with their own squirrel rifles or inherited um, pistols or whatever else they had on hand to try to protect 
their their kids because there were the Klan was riding through, the White Citizens Council was riding through, other ruffians are coming through. It was it was a real serious and dangerous moment for the black families. Well, let's listen to the first of these clips. And this is Joanne Allen, the student you referenced earlier, uh, telling CBS about what it was like being a student that first year of integration. And then Monday morning, when we started to school, there were only a few people around. And I thought maybe, well, they just here to be curious and they wanted to see us come in and that they would leave later. But then on the next day when things, when more people came and, and a young boy started walking with signs, I began to wonder and think, well, maybe they're not going to accept us like I thought they were. And um, on Wednesday morning, I almost tried to go back home because there were so many people. And they looked so mean. They, they looked like they just wanted to grab us and throw us out. They didn't want us at all. I could just see their hate in their hearts. And when we got inside the school, most of the children were very nice to us. And then there were some, you could tell, that they didn't want us there. Rachel Martin, as the semester progressed, what was the learning situation like for both black and white students with all of this attention on the town, with all of the people protesting outside? Were they actually able to learn? I think it was a terrible learning situation, um, particularly for the black students. At the moments of crisis, there are a couple of times when the riots outside the school get particularly bad and happen during the school day. At that point, actually, a lot of the white students disappear from classes and just stay home. Their parents say, this is not safe for you. We're getting you out. Um, or they join the protesters themselves. That's the other thing that happens. Um, so in, during those weeks of the year, everyone's education suffers. For the rest of the time, I think many of the white students go through their school day just like it's normal. Um, for the black students, it never normalizes. So they are pushed and harassed in the halls. They come into the school and they or into their classrooms and they would find tacks on their seats or they would find racial slurs on their desks or they would have their hair pulled. The girls particularly would get their hair pulled. They would be just, they were never safe. They could never settle in. Um, and that level of vigilance, that level of fear changes the way our brains function and actually makes it much harder for kids to absorb new knowledge to make those new neural pathways that you need to be making as you're trying to pick up algebra or physics or French or whatever your class is, um, it, it really stymies your learning. And so they, they had a really hard time. Um, yeah, they had a really hard time. Let's hear the perspective of Principal DJ Britton, also in the same CBS documentary. For myself, the first, uh, uh, Day and night, my telephone rang incessantly. I, I guess my life was uh, threatened 10 or 12 times by anonymous telephone callers who would all hang it up. I have uh, since had my phone number changed four times uh, to keep from uh, getting these annoying calls. Uh, I received letters, many through the mail. Uh, I, I received two today. Uh, one of which was an unsigned letter, of course, which said that uh, they felt that uh, I was a low-down person and used other vile names and felt that uh, someone should throw acid in my face or in the face of someone in my family and uh, that I wasn't fit to live. When you hear him describe that, what's your reaction? I... There are a few people from this story who haunt me, um, who really broke my heart as I learned about them, and Principal Britton is one of them. He ended up, I said he began the year as a law and order segregationist, 
Um, he actually ended up being a fairly committed integrationist and later in his career made some dramatic, dramatic changes, um, implementing Black Studies curriculum at the new district he was superintendent of and equalizing racial balance. Like really, it, this experience really changed him. He's someone who grew quite a lot, but it also broke him. And I don't think we've spent nearly enough time talking about how fighting for justice and equality can cost people an, an incredible amount. Um, the black students, many of them walked away with symptoms of PTSD. Some of them continue to struggle with some of that to this day. Um, and, and people like Principal Britton also, yeah, they, they were really broken by what happened. Agitating even further were some people from around the country. One person that uh, makes many appearances in your story is a man by the name of John Casper. We're going to play a clip from him so people can hear what he had to say, and then you can tell us who he was and what role he played in Clinton, Tennessee's efforts at desegregation. I say integration can be reversed. It can be stopped anywhere, provided an attack is made at every single level that meetings of the county court are attended, that the constant self-same demands are made, that people, people keep hitting the judge who made the original ruling, that pressure, tremendous pressure, is brought to bear on that school principal, on the school board, on the local newspaper, or whoever it is that happens to be responsible. There's no sense any longer appealing to Senator so-and-so, or President, or the President, or the Supreme Court judge, it has got to be a pressure down here which is more or less like a lit stick of dynamite and you throw it in their lap and let them catch it and then they can do what they want with it. Rachel Martin, who was John Casper and what did he do in Clinton that, that changed the situation? Uh, John Casper was quite a character. Um, he was originally from New Jersey and educated at Columbia. And then while he was at Columbia, he fell under the influence of the fascist poet Ezra Pound, who was actually in jail for having supported Hitler and Mussolini. Pound and Casper exchanged multiple letters. They averaged about one letter a week from what I can calculate over the next decade. And so Casper adopted a lot of Pound's philosophies around racial equality. Um, he became, became a virulent anti-Semite, partially because of Ezra Pound. Um, yeah, he was, he was basically a neo-Nazi. He ended up learning about Clinton. And the Saturday before school desegregation happened, he rode the bus into the middle of town. He had a pocket full of dimes and he started calling people. He walked around some of the white neighborhoods and tried to meet people. The local officials hear about him and say, oh, this, this guy cannot be allowed to continue this work. So they actually arrested him on Sunday for disturbing the peace. And um, I believe at that point also attempting to foment a riot, but I'm not positive. Um, and he was kept in jail until Thursday of the first week of school. Now. He would tell you, if he was still alive, he would, he would claim. And many of the law and order segregationists in town would also have said that everything, all the violence that happened after that was because John Casper came to town, that it was his fault. Um, as I dug deeper into this story, the evidence really did not bear that out. Uh, he was one of several national segregationists who attempted to use Clinton to build their own reputation, their own name, their ability to lead the growing white supremacist movement that was happening across the country. So he definitely talks about having been a leader in Clinton, but he was an Ivy League educated Yankee who was in town for less than 24 hours before school started. Um, he was not trusted by the local white supremacists. He was not, offered leadership of their organization. In fact, I always get the names backwards, but one group founds the Anderson County White Citizens Council, 
And then I believe it's John Casper founds the White Citizens Council of Anderson County, and they are rival organizations. And they ban him from all of their meetings. He only has a couple, he only has about a dozen people in his organization. And there are hundreds in the locally run organization. The local Clavern also bans him from their meetings. And by December, everybody is so sick of him that somebody actually bombs his headquarters to let him know you have to get out of town if you don't leave here. Next time, you know, it's your life. Uh, so he is blamed for a lot of the violence, uh, but it was very much a homegrown movement from everything I can tell. He made, he sorry, use it. Uh, sorry for interrupting. He made reference to the stick of dynamite. And <clears throat> in fact, throughout your story, there is one bombing after another during that first year of Clinton High School. <gasps> so much dynamite in that town. Why, why was that? There's so much dynamite in that town. It's coal mining country. About a quarter of the men in the county were at one point or another employed in the mines. So everybody has, and plus it's a rural county. You need to blow up tree pumps and get rid of stumps. And it's just explosives are very common. Um, and anytime there had been any sort of labor protests in the town, there had always been the threat of dynamite being used and with the desegregation conflict, dynamite actually is used. Um, but it's such a common thing that at, at first, uh, the first explosion is actually done with blasting powder, not dynamite. And the sheriff says, oh, that wasn't real. If, if they wanted to do damage, they would have. And so the first, the first explosion is just kind of explained away or laughed at because everybody knows blasting powder doesn't do anything. It's, it's a very different world. <laughs> Your your book provides a, a real detailed look at the fall semester of the students and long series of protests, harassments, arrests, violence. Uh, I want to fast forward to election day and introduce mm -hmm. another person into the mix, Reverend Paul Turner. We do have a clip from him, but you want to tell me about Reverend Turner's involvement in Clinton High School's first year of desegregation. Yeah, Paul Turner came from West Tennessee, so he was not a local. Um, he was a Southern Baptist pastor who had been raised within the segregated South, raised to be a good white supremacist like everyone else around him. Um, when he went off to seminary, he his main advisor was a man named Olin Binkley, who was a white man who really believed that the Bible preached racial equality. And he used his position in this Southern, Southern Baptist seminary to try to encourage his students to embrace that belief as well. Um, Paul Turner doesn't, but he explores the theological backings behind this argument. When he came to Clinton, he took over the First Baptist Church it had already been the largest Baptist church in town, but then Paul Turner was young, he was charismatic, he began drawing in all sorts of additional people who left their smaller churches to join his, and it became a powerhouse. He was the leader of the local temperance movement. Politically, he was very engaged and active. And he, by the time desegregation begins, had quite a bit of sway within the town. He is another one. He never at the in the beginning said integration is right. He did say we must be Christians first and segregationists second. He attempted to encourage his parishioners away from violence. He did not succeed. Um, but he really he really wrestled with these questions as the school year wore on. Here is uh, Paul Turner again in the CBS See It Now 1957 documentary on Clinton, Tennessee. One of the uh, Citizens Council members had stationed himself with about three other men on a corner. As I made my way to that corner, they jumped me. One man successfully held my arms down and allowed the number one uh, man of their gang to uh, land a pretty good blow upon my nose. It was at that time also that I realized I had to defend myself in some way, and so I took off after the man who 
had slugged me, pinned him against a, a car, and immediately about uh, eight to ten people were on our backs. Rachel Martin, did the beating of Reverend Turner work for the segregationists? No, no, it backfired. So the, the backstory to that story, um, at the end of November, the black students had actually stopped going to school to protest the amount of violence that they were facing. And Paul Turner volunteered to walk them into the school building, which is what led to him being beaten up. Um, it was the same day as the local election and the Anderson County White Citizens Council, as well as the Tennessee white youth had endorsed a slate of white supremacist candidates. I don't know that they would have won, but they were expected to put in a pretty good show at the polls that day. But when the news comes out that Turner had been attacked and beaten up, um, people who fell on the law, law and order side are irate. This personalized it in a way that none of the other violence had. This was their pastor. They loved him. They, they, they couldn't believe a man of God, a white man of God in particular, had been beaten up. And so they lined up to vote for anybody except for the white supremacist candidates. And there are stories of people coming home from college up in Philadelphia to vote. Uh, people leave their business trips early to make sure they get back in time to vote. It, it really, it really worked against the white supremacist movement to do this. By the time the new school year uh, began the second semester, uh, sorry, the second semester of the first school year. Mm -hmm. uh, how many of the 12 were still left in high school? About half of them had left by the time the January rolls around. Um, we had heard from Joanne Allen, Joanne Allen Boyce now. Um, her family had actually evacuated to California because of all of the violence that she had faced. Her father had also been a target of some violence because of the stand they were taking. Several of the boys had decided they didn't want to put up with this anymore. Um, and they dropped out of school and decided to go elsewhere. So the numbers by the beginning of the spring semester were much lower than they had been. The focus in the second semester for many of the protesters and white supremacists was one student, Bobby Kane. Why was he of particular interest? Bobby Kane was one of two black seniors at Clinton High School that year. And there was a real feeling that it was one thing, you know, if a freshman or a sophomore made it through a year of school, you didn't want that to happen, but you could still force them out of school or force, you know, their parents, many of the black students' parents lost jobs. You could force them out of town that way. And then as long as, who would, they weren't included in the school yearbook, so you could kind of pretend it had never happened. If someone graduated from Clinton High and got a Clinton High diploma, however, the feeling was the school at that point was permanently desegregated. You could never deny, you couldn't pretend it was over. And so the other black senior was a kid named Alfred Williams. He was much older. He'd really struggled academically. And early in the second semester, the Tennessee white youth actually drive him out of school. They provoke a fight. He was already struggling with his classes. Um, the violence had kept him from being able to do well in his classes. And so he gets expelled from the school. That left only Bobby Kane as this, as this kind of existential threat. Um, and so they, he, was, he was the focus for the rest of that school year as they tried to make sure he could never get that diploma. One week prior to graduation, describe the size of the local Klan rally that took place. In um, it, it was massive and it sounds haunting as well. There, were, um, there was a white teacher, Margaret Anderson, who lived nowhere near where the rally took place, but said she could see the reflections of the flames from the fires in the night sky that night. There were, it was, it was 
huge. People around the town could hear the shouts, um, could hear the chanting. So, and it was, it was part of what had been basically nine months of similar campaigning and violence. And so it was a real demonstration for people who lived in Clinton that nothing had changed. They were as vulnerable as they ever had been. They were no closer to winning this fight than when they had started in August. Um, that the white supremacists had not given in, they hadn't resigned themselves. It, it wasn't going to get better anytime soon. So was Bobby Kane able to graduate? He was, and he even was able to walk across the stage. So I, I think that should have been a very special moment for him. That should have been a moment of real triumph. Unfortunately, after he graduated, when he was taking off his graduation robes and attempting to you know, kind of finish out his day, he was attacked again. And um, yeah, he wasn't even allowed to have that moment. But he did have quite a summer, as you describe it after school ended. What was what happened to him over the next couple of months? Well, he was the first black graduate from a formerly all white school that had been desegregated as a result of Brown versus Board. And so civil rights institutions and large black churches around the nation brought him in. He appeared at one point with Jackie Robinson at a massive rally in New York City. Um, he's hosted at several of the large black churches up north. Um, and then one of the, the black papers says, oh my goodness, you know, his dad would, had struggled to find work as a result of desegregation. His family financially had, had really been impacted by this. And so they began taking up a collection to fund his college tuition so that Bobby Kane could go to college. And it ended up being enough to let him graduate debt free. So he had quite the summer after it all happened. So the new school year opened in 1957 without Principal Britton, who was exhausted and stepped down. The new principal came into place. Uh, and was he better able, after a years of experience, to navigate what uh, the second year would be like? W.D. Human, the, the new principal, was a very apparently a very gruff man, very different from DJ Britton in all ways. He was quite a bit taller, just quite a bit more intimidating, uh, did not care if people liked him at all. And he also, at this point, Bobby Kane had graduated. So they'd already passed that marker of existential dread that the segregationists had had. Um, so in some ways, I think, that next school year was much more peaceful. There were not there were not the protesters out in the streets. Um, there had been a big federal case that Robert, Robert Taylor had overseen over the summer, where many of them had been convicted on federal charges as a result of their actions. So it, he he inherited a different situation inside the school, though it was still very hard for the black students. Um, they still were extremely isolated. They did not have friends among their white classmates. And in many classes, it was only one black teenager in a sea of white kids. And so they were also still targets of the same sort of harassment, the insults, the threats of violence or actual violence happening. Um, so it was better, but much remained exactly the same. And it only lasted until Sunday, October 5th. What happened on that day? Yeah, that was actually the next school year, which for oh, me is one of the fascinating times of question. Yeah, it was basically the third year, October 5th, 1958. Um, unknown, well, theoretically unknown. I've heard multiple people in Clinton say they know exactly who it was, but anyway, theoretically unknown. Uh, instigators put about a hundred sticks of dynamite at key places around Clinton High School. And again, these are people who know and understand dynamite. They're not just sprinkling it. They put it exactly where they know it will put, do the most damage. And it they blow up the high school and destroy it. it. It was completely gone. What was the reaction? 
the teachers and the students say, you don't get to win. And Monday morning, so about 24 hours after the explosion, classes still happen. They all met up. It was a beautiful fall day. And so everybody sat on the schoolyard around their bombed out building and held classes and kept on going. Um, a lot of the other white law and order segregationists begin, they find uh, an abandoned black elementary school in Oak Ridge and do their best to retrofit it as a high school. And so they, they begin using that as their high school. Local officials start trying to figure out how to rebuild the high school. So lots of folks go into that basic damage control mode. But they also say, it is time for us to come to some sort of detente. I don't think you can say that they found peace, but they chose silence. And everyone basically quit talking about what had happened in 56 and 57 and said, in order for us to coexist, we just, we just have to stop. And so at that point, many people really just quit talking about the issues in the town, about the violence that had separated them, about any of these other larger situations that the desegregation had brought to light. We have about seven minutes left. Uh, after the bombing of the school, two national figures became involved in Clinton to help them move forward. Columnist Drew Pearson, and for people that don't know him, he was enormously uh, influential at that point in his career, a nationally syndicated columnist, and also the, evangel uh, the evangelist Billy Graham. Uh, how, yeah. how did they assist Clinton and how impactful were they? Well, Drew, Drew Pearson was one of the first people on the scene. He was there long before any of the other national media arrived, and he began writing about the high school and the destruction of it and what had led to this. And he concocted a plan that he asked other teenagers around the nation to give up a Coke. At that point, a Coke cost a nickel and a brick to rebuild Clinton High School cost a nickel. And so he asked kids to skip a Coke for that day and send their nickel to Clinton High School. And basically those donations, one nickel at a time, are much of the money that went to rebuilding the school. Uh, the federal government sidestepped their responsibility. Uh, Eisenhower refused to even meet with the officials from Anderson County when they came to try to drum up federal support to rebuild the school. And so they really needed those sorts of donations. And that's what Drew Pearson did. Billy Graham had begun, he, he did not, he had not yet gone as far as he would, um, but like Olin Binkley, he had decided that segregation was ungodly. And so he had begun insisting upon teaching preaching at integrated crusades. And he came to Clinton um, in December of 58, and he preached about the need for racial reconciliation. And he did so before an integrated audience at the, the only thing that survived the bombing was the gymnasium. He did it at the gymnasium, which forced everyone who had come to town to hear Billy Graham to walk past the bombed out school and see the effects that hatred had had on this community. New school opened in 1960. Um, and as the story uh, moved on in these people's lives, you talked about how the black students who integrated the schools, um, many of them suffered from something we would call today PTSD. Two of the most tragic outcomes of this are DJ Britton and Paul Turner. How, how did, well, tell the story of what happened to both of them. Both of them tried to move on with their lives. DJ Britton earned a doctoral degree in education and became a superintendent of a school district in New Jersey where he implemented um, measures working toward racial equality. Paul Turner ended up first taking a church in Nashville, which had just survived its own desegregation crisis and he tried to work with them. Um, and he became eventually a professor of divinity out in California but neither of them 
recovered. They were both they were both just really broken by the hatred that they had received and by what had happened. And um, you know, both of them ended up committing suicide. And their families all said that it was a result of what had happened to these two men in 56. So in the couple of minutes we have left, uh, if you went to Clinton today, what would you find? Oh, well, in some ways the town itself looks, especially downtown, looks so similar to 56. Um, so if you pull up the Life magazine photos and you look at the downtown, you're going to think, oh my gosh, I know right where I am. I, that's where that happened. Uh, but at the same time, obviously, it's almost 70 years later. It's, it's changed quite a bit. Um, but if you do go to Clinton, I encourage you to head past the courthouse, go past the rebuilt high school, which is now Clinton Middle, and go up the hill, because at the top of the hill is what used to be the Black Elementary School, and it has been transformed into a fantastic museum dedicated to the Black community up there and to the 12 Black teenagers who had desegregated Clinton High. And there's a very moving statue, life-size statue of the 12 of them poised to walk down the hill that first day of school. Um, so it's, it's a moving commemoration. And you note that the story of Clinton is how people persevered and that they were just everyday folks, uh, notable for their ordinariness. Yeah, we have this myth that somehow change is affected by heroic, heroic figures, incredible speakers, change is a matter of people like you, like me, just very normal people showing up and doing the hard work in their own little corner of the world. And these were some people who did that. Their radical action was that they went to school and they demanded to learn. Rachel Martin, as we close here, uh, what? Uh, how do you see Clinton High School and the people of Clinton fitting into America's modern civil rights history? I think it is very unfortunate that they have been overlooked because they offer a different lesson than Little Rock or New Orleans with Ruby Bridges or some of the other places do. Um, Clinton High School is a story of students and teachers and parents, both white and black, finding their way through and persevering. Um, and as such, I think it gives us a real model for what it takes to work toward equality within our nation. Today, schools around the United States are more segregated than they were in 1968, the year that Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered. And we are resegregating our schools rapidly. And I think the dedication and the determination of these students and these educators is the sort of daily grit that is required for us to reverse that trend and to find actual solutions to the problems we face as a nation. It's not quick, it's not easy. It takes every one of us being committed and continuing to show up. And that is what these students and teachers model for us. The book about Clinton, Tennessee is called A Most Tolerant Little Town, The Explosive Beginning of School De Desegregation. Rachel Louise Martin, thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Much more detail, um, many more stories inside the book, but thanks for sharing so many of them today. Oh, I have appreciated this. Thanks so much for wanting to highlight the story. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. Remember, if you subscribe to this podcast, you'll never miss an episode. And I'd really like to hear from you about our interviews. You can email me at podcasts, that's podcast with an S, at c-span.org. Your feedback is welcome.